testing. Oops. Do not do. Yeah, my bad, my bad. Testing, testing. Okay, nice. All right, so welcome everybody to uh, this exciting session we have on random oracles. Uh, the first talk is on revisiting time-space trade-offs for function inversion. It's a joint work by Spencer Peters, uh, Noah Stevens-Davidovitz, uh, Theo Gao, and Sasha Golovnev, and Spencer will give the talk. So take it away. Thank you, Jonathan. This is such a cool venue. This reminds me of when I used to like sing back in undergrad. Anyway, okay, so I'm here to tell you about revisiting time-space trade-offs for Huh? No singing? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, just revisiting time-space trade-offs for function inversion. Uh, no no singing. But uh, yeah, this is joint work with my awesome advisor, Noah Stevens-Davidowitz, Xiao Guo from NYU Shanghai, and Sasha Golovnev from Georgetown University. So first off, what is function inversion? It's, it's what it sounds like. You're given a function f from some finite domain to itself. So think of the integers 1 up through capital N. And you're given a point y in the range of the function. <laughs> And you have to find a point x that maps to it. So just to be really, really concrete, um, suppose you had this function, and I asked you to invert 74, uh, you could return 2. Uh, so the big, the big question here is, how are, are you going to be given this function f? And I'm going to be going back to uh, the paradigm first proposed by Martin Hellman in his seminal 1980 paper, uh, Time Memory Tradeoff for Cryptanalysis. And I'm going to be treating f as a black box. So you can only put in inputs uh, and see the corresponding outputs. Now you're probably thinking, OK, if I give you an arbitrary, a arbitrary black box function and a, and a point in the range, and I ask you to find an inverse, well, you're not going to be able to do any better uh, than trying all the inputs. OK, OK, hang on. Uh, so let me show you uh, Hellman's algorithm for permutations. Let me show you how uh, the model that Hellman worked in. Uh, and then. Then we'll actually back out the, the sort of the specific model. Uh, so I'll show you Helen's algorithm for permutations um, because it's especially simple and beautiful. So the thing that's relevant about permutations is that their graphs uh, are disjoint unions of cycles. So the starting point of Hellman's algorithm is if I give you a point y to invert, and you get lucky, it lands on a small cycle. Well, now I can just start at my point y, and I can start calling f. I can iterate f of y, f of f of y, f of f of f of y, and so on, walking around the cycle uh, until I reach y again, and then I know I have found my inverse. But what happens uh, if, f, if the y lands on a large cycle? Now, it, it would take too long to walk all the way around this cycle. And this is Hellman's brilliant idea. He changes the game here. He says, all right. Suppose that I'm allowed, before I see the point that I'm supposed to invert, let me do a pre-processing step. Let me analyze the function. And specifically, what Hellman does is he stores points, these orange points, uniformly spaced around each cycle. And now, when a point comes in that he has to invert, he can you know, start as before, so start iterating f, f of y, f of f of y, until he reaches one of the stored points. And then he can hop, now you know what cycle you're on. So he can hop back to the previous point on the cycle and continue walking forward until you reach y. And then again, you've seen the inverse. So you've basically divided up your big cycle into many smaller cycles uh, with this uh, implicit back pointer. So let's analyze this real quick. So let's say you store, you space those stored points t hops apart. So here t is 3. Uh, then you're going to require t evaluations of f to invert y. And you're basically storing one out of every t point. So you're storing n, n over t points. And just stepping back here, uh, what, have, what have we accomplished? Well, really, we have two algorithms. We have a pre-processing algorithm and an online algorithm. And our goal is that if you, if you have a function f and you pre-process it to produce a data structure alpha, and then you give the data structure to the online algorithm along with oracle access to f, and you give it a point y to invert, it should return an inverse uh, with good probability. What that number is doesn't matter. Uh, it can be boosted. And I'm going to describe, so there are many, many computational, uh, uh, like there are many different resources you could try to optimize here. 
And I'm going to I'm going to tell you to keep in mind just the very minimal uh, the minimal resources that a function inversion algorithm wants to minimize. So you can even think of the preprocessing and online algorithms as having unbounded computational power. And the thing that you want to minimize, the thing that you absolutely must minimize, is the bit length of the data structure that the preprocessing algorithm writes down and the number of queries that the online algorithm makes to f. And I should say that uh, in this expression, I haven't specified where f comes from. So we'll think, we'll think uh, there are multiple settings here. So f could be a permutation. f could be an arbitrary function. f could be a randomly chosen function. Uh, and in this talk, we'll always think of y as being a worst case uh, challenge point in the range of the function. So what are some applications of this preprocessing paradigm? I think it's not just an interesting theoretical framework, but it also is a relatively reasonable uh, framework to think about. You could imagine uh, you're the NSA. You have a lot of computational resources. Wouldn't it be great if you could preprocess some widely used cryptographic function? And from then on, you could break the cryptography that's based on that function. Now, this is not actually practical with uh, reasonable cryptographic functions like AES-128. Nevertheless, these types of preprocessing attacks are used in practice, <laughs> typically by hackers who have managed to steal a database of password hashes, and they want to make a password recovery attack by inverting the hash function. And using this type of exactly this kind of technique, along with some clever heuristics, they can do that. Uh, lastly, an one more application I'll mention. Uh, you are a theoretical computer scientist. <laughs> I mean, this problem is so fundamental, it's going to be related to lots of other problems. And so you can reduce other, other preprocessing problems um, to function inversion. So uh, some of my collaborators and some other people um, used uh, function inversion algorithms to get a preprocessing version of threesome. Uh, and Henry, who's in the audience, and his co-author, Dimitri Kogan, uh, reduced uh, a problem in communication complexity called multi-party pointer jumping and another natural a data structures problem systematic substring search to the problem of, of function inversion. But these applications um, certainly require inverting functions that are not permutations. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So I showed you Hellman's algorithm for permutations. It achieves this trade-off, this query complexity of n over s. That's actually tight. Even for permutations, you need n over s queries uh, to invert. That was shown by Andrew Yao. Now, Hellman also, Hellman also uh, in his 1980 paper, considered random functions. And he argued heuristically that for random functions, you can achieve a slightly worse trade-off. So this query complexity of n squared over s squared. And in 1991, uh, Fiat and Naor came along. And they made, the, they made Hellman's argument rigorous, first of all. Uh, and second, they generalized his algorithm to handle worst case functions with, again, a slightly worse trade-off of n cubed over s cubed. So looking at this table, this sort of the big question staring you in the face is, what is the complexity of, of black box function inversion? Uh, what, what's the complexity of worst case function inversion? Is it n over s? Is it n cubed over s cubed? Um, and I, I like to say in this talk, we, do, we make a little bit of progress towards, uh, towards answering this question. You know, can we improve Fiat Naor? Can we improve uh, Yao's lower bound? Ah, sort of, sort of. OK, so what are our results? So uh, result one is an improvement to Fiat and Naor's algorithm, um, a, a small modification to their algorithm that yields a better trade-off in the regime where t is bigger than s. That's sort of the main result I want to show you today. And the next result I'm going to show you is a, is a lower bound. It's a lower bound for a fairly small class of function inversion algorithms, so a subclass of non-adaptive function inversion algorithms. And there are a few more things in the paper that didn't make it into the talk, which are essentially equivalences between different variants of function inversion. We have some search to decision reductions, but I won't get into those today. So all right, let's, let's dig into the first result. So Fiat and Neuer achieved this trade-off n cubed over s cubed. And we replace one of those factors of s with a factor of t. <laughs> and when you solve this, you get uh, this unwieldy looking trade-off. I think it's easier to visualize. So uh, here is the kind of landscape of function inversion. From left to right, um, you have permutations, random functions, uh, worst case functions. This green, the green shaded area is what was achievable with Fiat and Naor. 
um, and, and we get this uh, additional little green triangle in the upper left. So to tell you how it works, um, I have to get a little bit into uh, Hellman and into Fiat and AR. So the generalization of the algorithm I showed you, where you store the, uh, the points uniformly spaced around the cycle, is you store the endpoints of disjoint paths in the graph of the function. And just like before, this allows you to invert the points that are on those paths by walking to the end, jumping back to the beginning, and walking forward again. Now, the issue with this approach, if you're not dealing with permutations, is that you might not be able to cover the entire graph of the function uh, with disjoint paths, with long, with long disjoint paths. But um, Hellman observed that, OK, let's say I've got a random function. I can take n to the 1 third random points and view those as the start points of, of paths of length n to the 1 third. And it's not hard to see that a constant fraction of those paths will be disjoint. And so they'll cover about n to the 2 thirds points in the range of the function. Uh, so now I've covered a small fraction of the range of the function, and I want to boost my coverage. What can I do? So the key trick here is, let's say g is a permutation. And I can invert, then inverting g after f on g of y uh, gives you an inverse of f on y. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to repeat the scheme for many different compositions uh, g after f. And each of those schemes is going to cover a different small fraction of the range of the function. And if I do this enough times, I'll cover every point in the range with uh, good probability. OK. So that's, that's Hellman. That's Hellman for random functions. How, where does this break down for worst case functions? Well, the problem with worst case functions is that they can have points with lots of inverses. I'll call those junction points. And ra random functions just don't have points with many inverses. <laughs> And, and what happens at these points is that if you tried Hellman's suggestion and you picked some random start points, the paths would very quickly start colliding at the junction points. And then they wouldn't cover any new points anymore, and you wouldn't get any coverage. So you need to deal with these junction points. And how does Fiat and Neor deal with them? Well, they store a list L of the junction points. And then, then they store the disjoint paths data structure for a restriction of f that avoids the junction points. Intuitively, that's what they do. OK. So what is our, what is our improvement? It's, it's very, very simple. So Fiat and the ORS preprocessing and align algorithms have to agree on this list of the junction points. And the longer the list, the lower the number of inverses of the points that are in the restriction. So the better the trade-off you can get. And in Fiat and Neor, in Fiat and Neor's algorithm, the preprocessing algorithm comes up with the list, and it stores it in the data structure for the online algorithm to use. So they can't take the list to be any longer than length s, and that's how they get this n cubed over s squared trade-off, n cubed over s cubed trade-off. But is there any other way to synchronize the online and preprocessing algorithms on this list? So the list. You, you can think of the list as being a list of the elements with the most uh, inverses. But actually, what Fiat and Neor do is they just store inverses of random points. And that's something the online algorithm can do, right? The online algorithm can take inverse, can, can take uh, call f on random points. So if, if you could uh, just call f on the same random points that the preprocessing algorithm used to recover the list, then you could take the size of the list to be t instead of s and you would get our trade-off. OK. Uh, but I've cheated here a little bit. So the, the pre in this scheme, the preprocessing and the online algorithm need to use the same collection of random points. Um, and it, actually, this isn't as much of an obstacle as it might seem. So theoretically, um, in the preprocessing model, uh, we can show that the shared randomness comes without loss of generality. And, and this is just an adaptation of Newman's lemma uh, from communication complexity that converts uh, private coin protocols into public coin protocols. And although that method uh, leans a little bit on the non-uniformity non of the preprocessing model, if you wanted to run this attack in, in practice, you could instantiate a random oracle. 
So I don't really view the shared randomness as uh, a problem. Instead, it actually allows us to simplify the analysis quite a bit. OK. So now for something completely different, part two, result two, the lower bounds. So recall that Yao is lower bound, um, even uh, for inverting permutations. Um, so it's tight for permutations, but for inverting arbitrary functions, it could still be improved. Um, but it's been sitting there for 30 years. And uh, Henry and Dimitri actually gave good evidence why this might be hard to improve. Uh, they showed that any small improvement would give you new lower bounds in circuit complexity, and in some cases, quite strong bounds. Um, but for me, the thing which is really surprising about their result is that even if you were able to improve Gao's lower bound for no against non-adaptive algorithms, you would get these consequences. And non-adaptive algorithms, OK, so the evaluation points, you just have to choose them up front. You have to choose all the points you want to evaluate f on um, before you've seen any of the results. And non-adaptive algorithms seem very weak. The algorithm I showed you is very adaptive, right? You get the challenge point y, you say f of y, f of f of y. That's about as adaptive as you can get. So these algorithms seem so weak that uh, Henry and Dimitri uh, speculated in their paper that there is actually no non-adaptive algorithm that beats either asymptotically beats either storing the entire function table or <laughs> querying uh, all the points. And this actually, um, we observe that there is a very simple algorithm which uh, just barely beats the trivial inverter. And actually, in earlier versions of this paper, uh, we had a fairly sophisticated algorithm um, that achieves the trade-off I'm going to show you. Um, but an anonymous crypto reviewer actually found that there was a really simple way of doing it. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just tell it to you. So store the inverse table of the function. But instead of storing the whole inverse table, just lop off the last log t bits from each, <laughs> from each entry of the inverse table. So that leaves you with, uh, when you get a challenge, you look it up, you get the inverse with the last t bits missing. That gives you t candidates to search. So the online algorithm can simply check each of those t inverses. Um, and that will get you this trade-off, s is order n log n over t. And this, uh, this property where you have t candidate inverses defined by the preprocessing and the challenge, and you can just check them, um, this is a pretty nice property. So we consider this class of algorithms call them guess and check algorithms. And we showed that the, the simple algorithm um, is asymptotically optimal among guess and check algorithms. Uh, and the proof, the proof is quite simple. It's a compression argument. So I'll, I'll tell it to you. So for simplicity, let's say you have a guess and check algorithm that always succeeds. And it's got parameters s and t. Then I claim that you can encode any permutation using s plus n log t bits. And if you, if you, could, if you believe this, um, then you immediately get our, this lower bound um, because you need n log n bits to store our permutation. And the encoding is pretty simple. Uh, just write down the preprocessing. And then for each y in the range of the function, you run the online algorithm to get the t candidate inverses for that uh, point. And then you just write down the index of the one which is actually an inverse. So that's, that's your encoding. And then the decoding just follows the same, the same template. It runs the online algorithm for each point y, receiving the t candidate inverses for that y, and uses the stored index to figure out which one of those is really the inverse. All right. So um, I'll just leave you with a few open problems. And really, in my mind, there's only one open problem, which is to, which is to close this gap. Can we can we improve Yao's lower bound? Can we get better algorithms for worst case and, and random function random function inversion? And so, right, these these are these are the kind of moonshots. You know, you could try to improve Yao's lower bound um, against general non-adaptive algorithms, and you would prove some new circuit lower bounds along the way. Um, you could try to get um, a algorithm for worst case function inversion that runs in the, in the same trade-off that we have currently for random functions. That also seems quite hard. What are some problems which are maybe a little bit more tractable? 
So one thing that would be fun to consider are better algorithms if you only want to invert a small fraction of the range. Um, so you would, be work, you would be building on the work of Day, Trevisan, and Fulciani. And, and we think that we're pretty confident that um, the this, this same improvement for Fiat and Neor will, will apply to this setting, although we haven't checked it carefully. We think other improvements might also be possible. Um, also, if you, if you want to think about random function inversion, consider thinking about inverting injective functions instead. Because actually, that's, that's just easier. Um, so if, if you have an algorithm that inverts random functions, you can basically compose um, you can compose a random function after the injective function you wish to invert. Um, and inverting, it, there, there's a reduction. All right, thank you. So we do have uh, time for questions if anyone wants to come up to the front. I think maybe in the meanwhile, I just have a quick question about uh, maybe if you can say another sentence about this, um, you know, why assuming common randomness is without loss of generality? Oh, yes. OK. So you, you get basically a very small additive overhead to the, to the size of the data structure. And OK, so, so how does Newman's lemma work? You hard code a large number of possible randomness, randomness values into the, into the description of the online algorithm and of the preprocessing algorithm. So then the preprocessing algorithm, instead of sampling randomness and, and sending it to the online algorithm, it samples an index into this list and sends the index. So you so you save in the communication at the cost of this uh, this hard coding. Thanks. Okay. Uh, 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 really nice. Uh, could you say uh, what circuit lower bounds would follow from a solution to this problem? Yeah. So if you're able to in the in the regime in the large space regime, so if you can prove that any algorithm which uh, uses n log n over log log n bits of space requires n to the epsilon queries, then you get an explicit operator, a Boolean operator, that can't be computed by linear size log depth circuits. Wow. Uh, and if you, if you show an improvement elsewhere on the trade-off curve, so for other values of s and t, which are more in the middle, then you get a, low, uh, a lower bound invalience common bits model, which is, which is actually very similar to this preprocessing model. Thanks. I actually had one other quick question. I mean, uh, maybe you hinted at it at the end, but you know, at the beginning of your talk, you assumed that the domain and range were the same size. Um, do things fundamentally change when they're when they're different size? Um, actually, no. That's a great question. Yeah. So uh, uh, Henry Henry proved a result um, showing that if the range uh, is larger than the domain. Um, you you can reduce it to the case where the range and domain are equal. Okay, I believe I haven't looked at this in a while, but but I I know that this case where the the uh, range is larger than the do domain is not harder, um, and and if the range is smaller than the domain, it's a trivial reduction. And actually, one of the auxiliary results that I didn't present is an extension of, of Henry's result to a uh, average case version of of function inversion. Uh, yeah, so it's it's mostly for syntactical convenience that we take the range and domain to be the same. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank the speaker again. And we'll just wait a minute or two. Uh, I don't. I, I'm not sure where the other speaker is, but anyway, I think we're not supposed to begin for another two minutes. Hi, I am the remote speaker for this session. Oh, it's remote. Yeah. Uh.
Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear us, Ashuji? Yes. I don't think we hear you. Uh, oh, okay. We hear you now. I think. Ready to go? Yeah. Just say. Uh, just say hello. Okay, am I? Am I audible? I think uh, feedback. Is it, yeah. You want to. Uh, am I audible now? Oh, are we good? Okay. All right. So the next talk will be uh, on the query complexity of pre-processing attacks. Uh, this is work with uh, Ashwajit Goshal and Stefano Tesaro, and um, uh, Ashwajit will give the talk. Thanks. Uh, uh, very broadly, this uh, work is aimed at understanding the offline costs of pre-processing attacks. Uh, abstractly, we can uh, think of an adversary as being given some problem instance uh, and then running for a certain amount of time t. Uh, it succeeds if it returns a solution for the given instance. In this talk, we are concerned with a more general type of attack known as a pre-processing attack, uh, originally due to Hellman. Uh, here, we consider a two-stage adversary where uh, Prior to seeing the problem instance, the offline adversary runs for some time t1. Uh, it comes up with some advice string uh, of some bounded length s. Uh, then the online adversary is given the advice uh, along with the problem instance. And within some time budget t2, it outputs a solution. A classical interpretation of pre-processing attacks is in the context of non-uniform security. Uh, where the mere existence of some advice uh, can uh, impact security, regardless of how long it takes to produce the advice. Uh, in this case, uh, offline time doesn't really matter, uh, only the advice sets. Uh, and a number of works have embraced this viewpoint and uh, have studied inherent trade-offs between advice size and online time. Uh, by either giving attacks or proving lower bounds in ideal models uh, that show that certain trade-offs are inherent. In this work, however, we want to look a bit closer at the offline complexity and ask ourselves uh, whether we should care about it. And if so, uh, what we can say about it. Uh, we contend that in some cases, we actually want to run a pre-processing attack, and I'll give you some examples shortly. Uh, in this case, uh, it is important that the offline time complexity is feasible, and also that it is worth it to run the attack. Uh, uh, to start off, uh, we establish an easy baseline. Uh, if uh, T star is the runtime of the best possible online only attack, uh, since we are uh, going the extra mile with the pre-processing attack, we would of course want uh, the online time T2 uh, to be much smaller than T star. And uh, this would mean that the magnitude of T1 has to be at least or more than the order of T star, uh, because otherwise there would be a better online only attack. Uh, so one may argue that such an attack is not really worth it as the offline time complexity is always higher than T star. Uh, however, taking a closer look, uh, there are at least two situations where this is okay. Uh, one example uh, is the setting uh, where the uh, online time is very limited due to a short timeout. Uh, uh, prior work has shown an attack of this flavor in uh, breaking discrete logarithm online within the TLS key exchange sessions using large amounts of preprocessing. Uh, here we clearly need to act fast. Uh, so a large amount of preprocessing is in fact justified. Uh, another example is the setting where uh, preprocessing advice can be reused. Uh, uh, for example, in the context of rainbow tables uh, for inverting password hashes. Uh, even though computing a rainbow table costs as much as uh, a full-fledged dictionary attacks, uh, the fact that this rainbow table can be recycled is what makes it worth it. So we've established that there are indeed settings where an explicit uh, pre-processing attack makes sense, 
In these cases, it is important to understand the time complexity uh, of the offline phase. But the question is whether we can actually show something interesting. Uh, it's not immediately clear uh, because uh, for the case of, uh, for example, the rainbow tables, uh, it is fairly straightforward to see that either the offline or the online phases has to take a time close to n. Uh, which brings me to a more interesting example uh, that has emerged in prior works on studying preprocessing attacks uh, for the solitaire Merkel Damgaard construction. Merkel Damgaard is uh, based on a compression function h that hashes 2n bits to n bits. We considered the keyed two block uh, variant where h is applied twice, first to the key and the first message block, and then to the output and the second message block. In particular, uh, we consider a preprocessing attack that finds collisions for some randomly chosen salt A. So here in this attack, in the offline phase, it simply finds collisions for roughly S different salts. Uh, in the online phase, um, it keeps making uh, distinct queries on its input salt till uh, one of the uh, query answers is a salt for which it found a collision in the uh, offline phase. It is easy to see that uh, to succeed with probability one, uh, the online phase would uh, need roughly two power n over s queries. Uh, and uh, that means that the product of the uh, number of uh, offline and online queries is roughly uh, two power 1.5 n for this attack. Uh, uh, what this implies is uh, uh, to get an attack that is that is better than the birthday attack, uh, we would need T1 to be at least uh, 2 power n. So it turns out that this attack is worth doing uh, if we need to find more than 2 power n over 2 different collisions. Uh, so, uh, the, the, but the bigger question here is, uh, uh, is this the optimal trade-off? And uh, how do we even prove it is? In this work, we developed uh, some techniques uh, that lead us towards answering such questions. Uh, more concretely, we introduce a new toolkit to understand the relationship between uh, offline and online time in preprocessing attacks. Uh, we first show a general result uh, that salting defeats uh, preprocessing qualitatively and later develop new techniques to prove quantitative bounds for uh, solitaire random oracles and Merkle Uh Before introducing our model, uh, let me start by briefly recalling the formalization of the auxiliary input ideal models in prior work on time-space trade-offs. Um, here, the adversary is a two-stage one. Uh, the first stage has unbounded access uh, to the ideal object. Uh, which may be a random oracle, an ideal cipher, uh, or a generic group oracle, etc. And it outputs S bits of advice, which it passes on to the second stage, uh, which gets to see the problem instead. Uh, this can make at most T queries to the ideal object and needs to solve the instance. Uh, our model uh, uh, is actually the dual to this time space trade off model. Uh, here, instead, uh, the first stage adversary is allowed only T1 queries to the ideal object. Uh, and the advice it can pass on to the second stage is unbounded. Uh, the second stage uh, can make T2 queries to this ideal object. Uh, we'll refer to such an adversary A as a T1, T2 adversary. Uh, our first result uh, shows that Salting generically defeats preprocessing in a qualitative sense. What do I mean by this? So let uh, pi g be a scheme that uses a random oracle g, uh, and say that uh, we can show for all uh, uh, adversaries that make at most t star queries, uh, the maximum advantage against pi g is upper bounded by 0 0.4. Then, if we consider a salted version uh, of the scheme where the salt is uh, picked uniformly at random, uh, we can show that uh, 
for all adversaries that achieve advantage 0 0.9, either uh, the offline time uh, must be nearly as large as uh, uh, as as large uh, as uh, t star times two power s, that is the time needed to break uh, it for every salt, or the online time has to be close to t star. Uh, so this says that to uh, 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 achieve advantage close to one, the adversary cannot really uh, trade offline time and online time. Uh, this result actually generalizes to any ideal primitive uh, beyond random oracles, and I refer you to our paper for the details. Uh, however, there are two issues with this result. Uh, first, uh, this uh, result deals with adversaries which have advantage uh, like close to one. Uh, and secondly, it holds for constructions uh, where every query to the random oracle is salted. Uh, something that is not a case for constructions like Merkel Damgard. So to overcome the first issue, let me first tell you a bit more about the technique uh, behind this theorem. Uh, that actually gives a generic technique to upper bound the advantage for any T1, T2 adversary. So as a first step, we show that for any adversary making uh, T, uh, if we have that, for any adversary making T star queries, the advantage is at most 0 0.4, then we can show that uh, for uh, any adversary making T star by two queries in expectation, the advantage is at most 0 0.9. Uh, this follows from uh, an application of Markov's inequality. Uh, we then show that this implies for any uh, T1, T2 adversary where T1 is at most uh, 2 power S times uh, T star by 4 and T2 is at most T star by 4, the advantage is uh, upper bounded by 0 0.9. So the second implication follows from a general, general lemma which says that for every T1, T2 adversary A, uh, one can construct an online only adversary B making uh, T1 by 2 power S plus T2 queries in expectation that has the same advantage. Uh, in conjunction uh, with this technique, we can use a, a prior work by Jaeger and Tessaro, which gave security guarantees for adversaries in terms of their expected running time uh, for certain uh, specific cases. Uh, that would actually give us concrete guarantees uh, for T1, T2 adversaries. Uh, here's an example. So we first looked at uh, pre-image resistance of uh, salted random oracles, uh, which entails that given a random salt uh, and a random point in the image of the random oracle, uh, the adversary needs to come up with a pre-image. Uh, using our generic technique, uh, along with the Jigger and Tessaro bound, we already get a tight bound here. Uh, in particular, uh, here we show that uh, the best attack is either uh, uh, offline only or uh, online only. And there's no uh, trade off between T1 and the T2. Uh, we next considered collision resistance uh, using the same technique. Uh, and again, while we uh, get a non-trivial guarantee here, uh, it turns out that the bound we get here is not exact. Uh, so the corresponding term for online only attack uh, doesn't completely match. Uh, so to resolve this, we actually give a direct proof of uh, the uh, tight bound using a compression argument uh, about which I'll uh, talk more momentarily. Uh, but this shows that the generic technique does not always give us the best possible bounds. Uh, so the examples so far, uh, uh, all the calls to the random oracle were sorted, but this is not the case in Merkel Damgaard. Uh, uh, we considered two block Merkel Damgaard and the techniques uh, we use thus far don't really directly apply. Uh, we considered uh, first the pre image resistance of two block Merkel Damgaard, uh, and we could actually prove a tight bound for it. Uh, so, uh, for a moment here, uh, this bound is more interesting than the prior bounds. 
the first term here is for an online only attack. Uh, the last term is for an offline only attack. Uh, while there is a term in the middle here, uh, uh, which actually shows that there is a regime where there is indeed a trade-off between offline and online queries. Uh, this wasn't the case for the previous bounds th that we gave. Uh, finally, we looked at the collision resistance of Merkel Damgaard. Uh, this, this problem was significantly more challenging than everything that came before. And we could prove a bound that was tight for online only attacks and offline online attacks. Uh, but uh, we could not give a matching attack for the offline only part of our bound. Uh, we conjectured that this bound can likely be improved and leave it as future work. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the main underlying challenge of uh, these direct proofs. Uh, uh, it is the analysis of the offline only attack. Uh, for example, uh, for the analysis of the uh, collision resistance of uh, solitary random oracle, uh, we need to give an upper bound uh, on the number of saws uh, for which the adversary can find collisions in the offline phase. Uh, actually, an upper bound on the expected number of sol suffices, but it is unclear how to prove an expectation upper bound when the queries are all adaptive. So what we did here uh, is we showed that for an adversary making at most T1 queries, uh, the probability that the adversary uh, finds collisions for more than uh, roughly two, T1 by 2 power n by 2 sols is very small. Uh, we show this using a compression argument. Uh, so the compression, compression lemma says essentially that it is impossible to compress a set of random elements even relative to a random string. So our strategy here uh, would be to encode the random oracle uh, using the offline only adversary uh, and then show that as long as this adversary finds collisions for k different solves, uh, decoding uh, would succeed. Uh, Here's a brief example of how the encoding algorithm would work. Uh, so consider that uh, these are the queries made by the adversary, uh, these uh, eight queries here. Uh, I have highlighted uh, the collisions using color. And on the right, we have how the query graph looks like. Uh, the encoding would consist of uh, all the uh, query indices uh, uh, so for, for every salt, it has uh, the a pair of uh, uh, you know, all, all the colliding query uh, index, uh, index for, for the salts for which the adversary finds uh, collision. Uh, note that uh, if there's more than a pair of uh, colliding queries, the adversary just stores, uh, yeah, the encoding just stores uh, one pair, for example, for the salt A2 here. Uh, uh, th there are three uh, queries with the same answer, uh, but only the first two are uh, part of the encoding. The last one isn't. Uh, and uh, and and along with this, the encoding also contains the answer of the random oracle queries, except the uh, colliding answers. And finally, the rest of the evaluations of the random oracles are appended at the end. Uh, the decoding procedure would run the adversary uh, and uh, answer its queries with the answers in the list, unless it finds a query uh, whose index is in the set S. If so, it checks whether it can find uh, another query whose index is also in S and on the same sort. Uh, for this query, it doesn't find such a uh, query and just answers with the next element in the list. Uh, but for the third query here, it uh, finds that uh, the query two was also on the same sort, and uh, both two and three are in the list. So it just answers with the answer of two. Uh, so this is how compression is achieved. And applying the compression lemma uh, would give us the probability bo uh, bound that we want. So this was already uh, somewhat involved, uh, but uh, things get a lot more messy uh, when we try to analyze uh, Merkel-Damgaard. Uh, 
Uh, this is because we need to reason about the number of salts uh, for which the adversary can find these uh, diamond-like structures. And for parameter regimes where T1 is much larger than 2 power n, uh, this is common really hard to reason about. Uh, because several of these salts might uh, share queries uh, in these structures. Uh, and it, it, one needs to be extremely careful to avoid double counting. Uh, so in, in the paper, we gave more sophisticated compression arguments uh, to prove something non-trivial, uh, but it's not necessarily tight. Uh, so to conclude, we introduce this new offline online model and uh, show that uh, salting defeats preprocessing generically in a qualitative sense. Uh, we give uh, new techniques to give more precise bounds. Uh, there are many open problems from this work. Uh, so first is uh, closing the gap for uh, two block MD collisions. Uh, going beyond two blocks for Merkel Dam Guard, and most importantly, uh, developing techniques uh, that allow us to uh, analyze a more general model that considers all of offline time, space, and online time. Uh, the full version of our paper is on ePrint. Thank you. So we do have time for uh, a question or two, if there are any questions from the audience. Um, I, I had kind of maybe one question, uh, it, but you, you covered it in your last bullet here, but maybe if, if you can say one more sentence about like incorporating um, the advice size into your model. I mean, how hard do you think it would be to, um, uh, to, to generalize your techniques to that case or have you thought about it yet? Uh, like, uh, it, it, like uh, right now, it seems very out of reach to incorporate like advice size, uh, like given the techniques that we have for like type based trade offs. And, uh... Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, why don't we thank the speaker again and. Um... We have about a five minute break until the next session begins. So if you want to run over to the next session, another session, you can.